1 Corinthians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 6. Paul says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word this morning. We pray that as we open it up to study it, that we will allow the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We have the word in front of us. We have a complete revelation from you. We have your Holy Spirit living and dwelling and residing within us. And when we come to your word and we read your word and we study your word, the Holy, it, it, it exercises a spiritual muscle in the inner man of the believer where the Holy Spirit takes the truth there on the page and communicates it to our inner man. And even as we begin to look at the mechanics of how that actually works, that we'll have clarity from your word on those issues. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we've been looking at, as I said, the trilogy of verses there in verse 6, 7, and 8 most recently, dealing with the wisdom of God and a mystery, and dealing with what Paul was speaking among them that are perfect. And I just want to make a few review points about this before we move on into new material, all right? Now, it appears that I am already encountering a problem. The wisdom of the princes of this world is first introduced in verse 6. He says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. They're introduced, they're introduced to you in verse 6, the wisdom of the princes of this world. And the wisdom of God in a mystery is also introduced to you in verse 7. He says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. So the wisdom of the princes of this world is first introduced in verse 6. And they did not know the wisdom of God hidden in a mystery in verse 7. So to be clear, the principalities and powers uh, in heavenly places, the rulers of the darkness of this world, were not able via their own wisdom to know what God and his wisdom had kept secret. Look at verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have what? Crucified the Lord of glory. So according to verse 8, acting in accordance with their own wisdom... Okay, that, that you first encounter in verse 6, it, and with complete ignorance of what God kept secret from them in verse 7, the princes of this world bring about an event, namely the crucifixion of Christ, that ends up to be the thing that spoils their best laid plans. And if the princes of this world had known about the wisdom of God in a mystery there in verse 7, verse 8 tells you they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, I got these mixed up already somehow, and I don't know how that happened, but I want you to come with me to Ephesians. I'm just going to park the PowerPoint right there for now and come with me over to Ephesians. Come over to Ephesians chapter 3. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, what we learned is that God secures his ultimate victory by keeping a secret about what he intended to do before the foundation of the world, informing the body of Christ on the basis of the cross work of his Son. Not knowing the wisdom of God, not knowing the wisdom that God kept hidden himself, the princes of this world go and they bring about the pivotal event, namely the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, that completely, uh, and they do it with, with complete ignorance of what God is ultimately going to accomplish through that event. And the princes of this world, they, they bring it about, the crucifixion of Christ, ignorant of its full impact. Ignorant of its total weight of all that God was going to do through that cross work. And had they known it, they would not have acted as they did. And so God keeps that information back from them. We, we ended, come over to Ephesians 3 if you're not already there, with verses 9, 10, and 11. Verse 9 it says, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. See, has it now been revealed, has it now been made known that which they didn't know before? If they'd known what God has revealed and made known now, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. They never would have taken the Lord Jesus Christ and had him, and had him killed. 
So today in the dispensation of grace, God wants all men to know the fellowship of the mystery and to be involved in the educating of the principalities and powers in the heavenly places in the manifold wisdom of God. Look at verse 9 again. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Verse 10, to the intent that now, that's, that's now, that's right now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, when you and I teach and preach and make known and speak about the wisdom of God and the mystery, we are educating the principalities and powers in the heavenly places in things that they didn't know about. And, you, and they didn't know about them because 1 Corinthians 2 says they didn't know about it. And if they had known about the hidden wisdom, the wisdom of God and the mystery, they never would have killed who? You see that verse? You see there in verse 10 where it says the manifold wisdom of God? I was going to say this last Sunday and I forgot, and I even forgot my visual. That idea of manifold. Before GPS, how many of you guys remember the old map that you'd bring in the car on vacation? That thing would start off this big, right? And then you'd open it, and then you'd open it, and then you'd open it, and open it, and open it, and every time you open it, what happened to the map? That's that idea of manifold, right? The wisdom of God in a mystery is that manifold knowledge. It's that hidden wisdom. And every time you think that you've got an understanding of what that mystery is, you look at it again or you open up another part and you realize, oh, I didn't know that before. And you, you study that and you go a little further and you open it up again and again and again and again. And you, and you want to know what? You can, you can do that your whole life and never fully get everything that God has to say to you through the mystery. Because it's the manifold wisdom of God, okay? It is, it is the sum total of God's hidden wisdom that he has made known and revealed to you and I through the pen of the Apostle Paul. It's an amazing thing to think about that. And it's even more amazing to think about the fact that what God has done in his manifold wisdom is he has chosen to have you and I, these creatures of dirt, right? Genesis chapter 2. Be the ones that are responsible in this dispensation of grace for teaching principalities and powers and heavenly places things that they had no other way of what? Knowing. And when we do that, when we stand for that truth, we are involved in that particular ministry in making known throughout the heavens that manifold, that multifaceted, that never get totally to the bottom of it, never totally comprehend all of it, wisdom of God. Now come back with me if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now all that is review and... Two loose ends that I forgot to mention last week. Now, with all that in mind, we now come to verse 9. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you about something. Before this week, I had sort of a, a bad thinking process about this chapter. Okay? And I don't know if it's because of the, the marginal notes here in my Schofield Bible or, or, or what the real reason I thought this was, but I tend to think, I used to think about chapter 2 here in like three sections. That you had verses 1 through 5, we're talking about one thing. The, tr the trilogy of verses 6, 7, and 8, we're talking about something different. And then verses 9, through, verses 9 through the end, verse 16, we're talking about yet a third thing. And I don't know if it's because of the way that, that, that the Schofield Bible lays itself out here that I, that I use, but I, I've sort of not had real sound thinking about that. And I, I never really realized that everything he's saying, I, I guess I knew it, but I ne didn't really know it, right? I, I didn't realize that everything he's saying here is all going together based on what he's just said, right? Look at how he ends verse 8. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew. Now, when he says that, he's referring back to verse 7 when he's talking about the wisdom of God and mystery, the hidden wisdom, right? If they had known that, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory, according to verse 8. And then you get to verse 9, and he says, but as it is written... Now, when he says, but as it is written, should you understand that to be in total, complete isolation from what he just said? No. He said, but as it is written in verse 9, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that what? For them that love him. Now, just think about that. Paul follows up the statement in verse 8. 
He follows up the discussion of the wisdom of God in the mystery in verses 7 and 8 with a contrast, but, and then an allusion made to the Old Testament when he says, but, as it is what? Written. The, the allusion he's making, hold your hand there and come over to Isaiah 64. The verse he's alluding to is Isaiah 64, verse, verse 4. Isaiah 64, verse 4. <clears throat> Isaiah 64, verse 4, he says here, For since the beginning of the world. Now, isn't that fascinating? Because what was he just talking about in verse 6? In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, excuse me, he's talking about the wisdom of God and the mystery, the hidden wisdom that God ordained before the world unto our what? Glory. And then the very next verse, he makes an allusion to Isaiah 64, verse 4. And when I go to Isaiah 64, verse 4, and I read that verse, it says, since the beginning of the world. So what, what Paul is talking about in verse 7 is something that predates what? The beginning of the world. And then in the next verse, he, in verse 9, he quotes, he follows up that discussion by, taking, by directing your attention to a verse where he's going to talk about some things that, that have been made known from the beginning of what? The world. Look at verse 4, he says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not what? Heard, nor perceived by the ear. Neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Now come back over to 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 2. Why does Paul make reference to that verse right after dealing with this trilogy of verses in 6, 7, and 8 about the mystery, about the God's hidden wisdom? In speaking, in, excuse me, in seeking to understand verse 9, let us not forget that in verse 6, Paul also addresses the wisdom of this world. Look, go back to verse 6. He says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are what? Perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world, that's whose wisdom? That's man's wisdom, right? Then he goes on in verse 6, he says, Nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Both of those categories of wisdom, as we've already seen, both of them come to what? Naught. The wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the princes of this world, both of those categories of wisdom aren't worth what? Anything. And he actually, in the, in the, in the passage, in verse 7 and 8, he deals first with the category of wisdom in the sense of he deals with the princes of this world first. And he tells you that if they knew about the mystery, if they knew about God's hidden wisdom, they never would have done what? Crucify the Lord of glory. Now in verse 9, he's going to follow that up by talking to you about how man, in his wisdom, can't know this information. So can, can, the, princes of the, can the princes of this world, could they have known, have any way of knowing about what God hid in himself? No. Could man, by his wisdom, have known what God hid in himself? So look with me at verse 9 again. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So if you look at the slide here again, in seeking to understand verse 9, let us not forget that in verse 6, Paul also addressed the wisdom of this world. With respect to the wisdom of God and the mystery, just as, just, just as it was beyond the capacity for the princes of this world to grasp what God ordained unto our glory and didn't tell anybody about, it is also beyond the ability of human reason to understand or to comprehend something, the totality of what God has prepared for them that what? So you need to look at verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our what? So think with me. This thing that God ordained before the world, it's to whose glory? Ours. Okay? Did any of the princes of this world know about this? No. Did man by his knowledge and ability know this information? No. So he says in verse 7, he says, which God ordained before the world unto whose glory? 
Then in verse 8, he deals with the princes of this world. Then in verse 7, he goes and he makes allusion to Isaiah 64, verse 4, and he says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that what? Could man, through his own faculties, eye, ear, or heart, could he have ever conceived, ever fathomed, about this glory that God had ordained unto us from before the world began? No, he couldn't. Paul is saying that his, Paul is saying that his glory that God ordained and prepared for the body of Christ is beyond anything that you have ever seen with your eyes, heard with your ears, or conceived in your heart. This is glory that cannot be known through the normal functioning of man's reasoning faculties. And he goes back and he makes allusion to Isaiah 64, verse 4. So have, listen, from, from the time God first created man and man rebelled in sin, has man gone about trying to establish his own righteousness based upon his own wisdom, based upon his own thought processes, based upon what he thought was best and so forth, in direct contradiction and rebellion to what God said, right? In the meantime, did God have some wisdom that he kept hidden from before the world began that had something to do with our glory? In verse 7. And now what Paul's doing is he's going to explain that the way that you're going to know about this, go to, go to verse 10. So in verse 9, can you know about this glory through your eyes, your ears, or your own human heart and mind? No. Then look at verse 10. But God hath what? That's an important statement, isn't it? Has God revealed and made known what you and I could never know through our own ability, through our own processes? So Paul is saying that. Now let's go to verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So if you think about that, once again, you need to note, and I apologize for the typo, you need to note the contrast with the previous verse. Those things that man was utterly incapable of knowing via his own wisdom, in verse, in verse 9, have been, made, have been revealed and made known unto us by the Spirit of God in verse what? 10. So in verse 9, in your own wisdom, in your own heart, in your own ability to comprehend, would you have ever fathomed something so great, so marvelous, so wonderful, as to be made a part of God's eternal plan and purpose? No. And the glory of being a part of that in the heavenly places, you never would have thought of that of your own, right? But what is verse 10 saying? <clears throat> verse 10 is saying God has what? Revealed it. Now let's look at that. Let's look at that some more. Notice the past tense on the verb hath revealed. <clears throat> he says, but God hath what? Does that mean he's already revealed it? So at some point before Paul writes 1 Corinthians, has God already revealed and made known information about his wisdom and a mystery? That's what he's saying, right? God has already made it known. His, it, he, says, he says there in verse, verse 10, excuse me, <clears throat> but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. So this information that they couldn't know in verse 9 has been made known and revealed by God in verse 10. Now, just a few technical things. <clears throat> in the Greek text supporting the King James Bible, this verb, translated hath revealed, is in the aorist tense and the indicative mood. And I don't mean to bore you with that, but what that tells you is that that indicates a punctiliar action or an action that happens at a specific time in the past. So there was a time when this information was hidden, and then God what? Reveals it and makes it what? No. That's what that means. So until God reveals, does anybody know the information? And according to what he's saying there, has God already revealed the information? That's what he's saying, right? He's saying there in black and white on the pages of your Bible that this information is already in the process of being what? Revealed and made known. So in other words, at a point in time prior to the writing of 1 Corinthians, 
The Spirit of God revealed or made known this information that could never have been known any other way. Look at verse 10. <coughs> but God hath revealed them unto us. Now what are the next three words? By his what? So how did God accomplish this? How did God make it known? Now I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I want to talk first about the English word revealed. <laughs> the English word revealed means to disclose. It means disclosed, discovered, made known, laid open, according to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Strong's Concordance defines the underlying Greek word as to uncover, lay open what has been veiled or covered up. And second, to make known, make manifest, disclosed, or disclose what before was unwhat. Now, why does that make sense? What did he just tell you in verse 8? He just told you in verse 8 that if the information had not been kept secret, if it had not been hidden, if it wasn't the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, and if it had been made known and disclosed and revealed, verse 8 just told you that the principalities and powers in the heavenly places never would have done what? Crucified Christ, right? So it makes sense then when it says there now in verse 10, it says, verse 9, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 9 he says, you can't know this through your own ability to read or hear or, or, or even fathom of it in your own heart. You can't know it through human wisdom and so forth. The only way you're going to know it is verse 10, but God hath what? Revealed. See, if God doesn't reveal, do you know the information? No. Why not? Because he has chosen to hide it. For, if you go to Ephesians chapter 3, that's the verse I want you to go to anyway. He has chosen to hide the, he had chosen to hide the information where? In himself. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 again. <clears throat> Just want you to see that issue of it being hidden God. Again, look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Isn't, he says, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid where? Isn't it fascinating how Paul goes to uh, Isaiah 64 and he brings up how man has been thinking about it and trying to understand it since the world what? Began. And what Paul is, is, what he's absolutely trying to do is he's trying to give you this contrast here, right? He's trying to get you to understand that you never would have known this unless God what? Revealed it to you. Now it says in verse 9, which, uh, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid where? In God. Go up to verse 5. You see this word revealed used in this context also. <clears throat> which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, talking about the mystery, how do I know that? Go up to verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me what? The mystery, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now what? Revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. How? How is it revealed? By what? By the Spirit. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. See, the language, folks, between 1 Corinthians and Ephesians is the same language. So the idea that, that, that Paul doesn't know the mystery, and he's not teaching the mystery, and it's not revealed until after the end of the book of Acts, that's just simply not true. Paul does know it, and he is teaching it. Now, in 1 Corinthians, we know from verse 6 that he's only teaching it among them that are perfect at that particular time. But the fact is, according to verse 10, has God already revealed it? If God hasn't already revealed it, then how in the world does Paul know it? Paul's not dreaming it up out of a clear blue sky one night because he had too much pepperoni on his pizza and stayed up too late at a church lock-in. <laughs> so you go back to verse 10, it says, But God hath revealed them unto us. How? How did he reveal it unto you? By his Spirit. So God, at a point in time in the past, revealed which before was unknown through the instrumentality of the Spirit of God. So God the Father moved to reveal or disclose the information, whereas God the Holy Spirit is the active agent whereby the information was what? 
See, God decided it's time to do what? Reveal it, right? And the active agent in making the information known, according to verse 10, and Ephesians chapter uh, 3, verse 5, is the Spirit of who? The Spirit of God. Verse 10, God hath revealed them unto us by His what? Spirit. The Spirit of God is the active agent in making the information known. Now let's look at the second half of the verse. So verse 10 says, But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. Now I have a question for you. Why is the Spirit of God the one that made it known? Why is the Spirit of God, in the first half of the verse, the active agent in terms of God revealing the information? The second half of the verse says the reason for the Spirit of God searches what? All things, yea, the deep things of who? Of God. So, note the present tense on the activity of God the Holy Spirit here. It says in the verse, it says, for the Spirit searcheth. Does it say the Spirit searched? Does it say the Spirit will search? The Spirit searcheth. In other words, it's an activity that the Spirit is continually what? Doing continually involved in as part of his ministry. So it's in the present tense. The Greek word translated searcheth here appears six times in the Greek text supporting the King James Bible and is variously translated as search two times, searcheth three times, and searching one time. Now if I look up those words in the English dictionary, the word search, the word search means to look over, or through, for the purpose of finding something. To explore, to examine by, by inspection, as to search the house for a book, to search the wood for a thief. Searching, looking into or over, exploring, examining, inquiring, seeking, investigating. Is God the Holy Spirit doing something? You know, I don't know what you're mental conceptions are of things, but it's not, like, it's not like the Godhead is sitting up there in heaven on stools, all, you know, eating bagels with Philadelphia cream cheese, just watching everything happen. Maybe that's not what you think, but I remember those commercials, never mind. They're doing something. What's the Spirit doing? He's searching. What's He searching? He, uh, verse 10 says, for, for the Spirit searcheth some things. He searcheth what? All things. The Holy Spirit is, is actively searching all things according to what this is saying, right? So God the Holy Spirit in the present is actively searching all things. Now as you look at the verse, then you encounter the word yea, right? He says, he says in verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of who? Of God. Now, we already saw in our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28, that the English word yea can have different meanings. Why don't you go back up to verse 28 of chapter 1 just quick. <clears throat> he says, And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring about the things that are. That English word, yea, can have a couple different meanings, okay? One of which just simply means to give mental affirmation. Pastor, are you going to eat lunch after church? Yea. Yes, I am. That's one meaning, right? Another, a second meaning would, would, uh, of, of the word, yea, is that it sometimes introduces a subject with, uh, with the sense of indeed, verily, truly, it is so. Hold your hand here and come over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, uses the word yea in this fashion, to, to introduce a subject. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said. In that function, it's, it's seeking that, it's that second usage to introduce a subject, right? So he's, the, what the serpent is doing is he's beginning a conversation with Eve here, and the way he begins his discourse with her, according to verse 1, it says, And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So that's a different 
function of that English word uh, yea. Okay, come back with me. Come over to Philippians chapter 1. Come over to Philippians chapter 1. A third usage of that word is a usage that is designed to enforce the sense of something that has just been said or elaborate or give further clarification or elaboration and enforce the sense of, of a statement that has just been made. You see this usage in Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 18. <coughs> Philippians chapter 1, <coughs> verse 18. He says, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and what? And will rejoice. So there, he's not just saying yes. There, he's not introducing a new thought. There, he's using the word yea to give clarification or elaboration on what has already been said, right? So with those three usages in mind, come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and look at verse 10 again. Verse 10, but God, hath, uh, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth what? So this, do we know from that that the Spirit searches all things? Then what's the verse say? Yea, and what? So in that verse, yea is serving that third function, right? It's serving to further elaborate on what he just said. Does the Spirit search all things? Yes. In the Spirit's ministry of searching all things, His searching of all things it extends to and includes the deep things of who? Of God. You see that? The deep things of God. So... In 1 Corinthians 2.10, uh, in this verse, the word yea is serving the third function, as I said, of enforcing the sense of something preceding it. In his ministry of searching all things, the Holy Spirit searches even the deep things of God. So, just think about that for a minute. Only the Spirit of God is capable of searching what? The deep things of God. So only he can search them, only he can reveal, uncover, and make known that glory that God has prepared for them that what? So go back to verse 9. Verse 9 told you that I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Man left to his own devices, does he have a clue about what, what God's going to do with those he loves? No. So how's man going to know it? How's man going to know it? It's going to have to be what? It's going to have to be revealed. It's going to have to be disclosed, right, in some fashion. Well, that's what the next verse is about. Verse 10 says, But God hath, he's already done it, revealed them unto us, by, through the, through, through the, through the, set, the third member of the Godhead, by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of who? Of God. So who is it that is able to uncover, manifest, reveal, and make known the deep things of God? The Spirit of who? The Spirit of God. Th think about what he's saying. This is why Paul only spoke wisdom among them that are perfect in verse 6. Go back to verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are what? Perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Okay? Because when he got into telling folks about the wisdom of God in a mystery, when he got into telling folks about God's hidden wisdom, and he got into telling folks about what God had ordained to their glory before the world began, he is involved in manifesting and revealing to them the deep things of who? Is it pretty deep concept that God would keep information a secret, allow the, allow the princes of this world to bring about the crucifixion of Christ, and then reveal information later on about all that was accomplished at that cross? that not just demonstrates how they're going to lose out, but how all of it was done to your glory. That's pretty deep stuff. You can't, can you know any of that stuff apart from the Holy Spirit revealing and making that known? No, you can't. 
So back to my point, this is why Paul only spoke this wisdom among them that are perfect or mature in verse 6, because when he got into telling folks about the wisdom of God and the mystery in verse 7, he was making known the deep things of God in verse 10. So today in the dispensation of grace, God through his Spirit is in the business of making known the deep things of God. Has God declared, go to Ephesians chapter 1, has God revealed and manifested His total, complete will to us today? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. <coughs> Paul says <coughs> that God has made known the mystery of, his, of what? His will. Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 9. Having, here it is again, having made what? Known. So, has he already made it known before he writes Ephesians? Had he already made known aspects of it before he wrote 1 Corinthians? Okay? So, notice what he says here. He says, having made known unto us the mystery of what? Of his will. When God reveals the mystery... And the Holy Spirit is involved in that, first to Paul, and then through Paul to us. Right? Is God disclosing the mystery of His very will? Is He disclosing that which He purposed He would do from before the world began? And the Holy Spirit is involved in that because the Holy Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of who? Of God. So if you're going to understand the deep things of God, are you going to be able to understand them apart from the ministry of God the Holy Spirit? Now, God the Holy Spirit, through the process of inspiration, we've been studying this in Sunday school, does, does he give to the Apostle Paul the words that God wants Paul to write down? Paul writes those words down, right? And not only that, does that same Holy Spirit that wrote those words live in Paul? Does he live in you? Does he live in me? Right? So when you and I, when we read God's Word, when we study God's Word, does the, the, does the Holy Spirit that wrote that Word live in you? So is there a capacity then, on the basis of something going on in the inner man of the believer, for that inner man to understand the deep things of God and the mystery of God's will? Thank you, Ernie. Yes. Ernie passes the test today. Go back to 1 Corinthians. You get a special reward in heaven, Ernie. <laughs> oh, we're going too far. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now watch verse 11. He says, he says here, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Now I have a question. As a human being, man is used here in a general sense, as a human being, that you have the capacity to know your own mind. Most of the time, right? Okay, we understand that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, right? But in a general sense, do you have the capacity in your humanness to understand your own human mind and spirit? Yeah. So he says here in verse 11, he says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? What he's doing here, the first part of this verse is really a rhetorical question. Notice there's a question mark there, too. Even in your Bible, it says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Now, is that a question that Paul expects you to answer? It's kind of, it's, it's a question whose answer is what? Obvious, right? What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Only the spirit of a given man knows his own mind. Okay? Now, if I had the ability to know your mind... I might not like what I, no, I'm just kidding. I might not like what I know, right? And you probably wouldn't like what you know about me, right? But the bottom line is, could you use that to your advantage? So what man, what man, it says here, for what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of the man which is in him. So a given man can have the capacity to know his own mind, but does he have the capacity to know the mind of someone else outside of that someone else telling them what their mind is. No. 
Okay, you can't. So look at the, how, what's the next word after the question mark? Next two words. Even so. Even so. Come on. Or likewise, or in the same manner, even so the things of God knoweth no what? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. But who? The spirit of who? Now, so let's back up. Do you have the capacity to know your own mind? Do you have the capacity to know the mind of another human? Not unless they tell you, right? So how are you ever going to know the mind of God? How are you ever going to know the mind of God? See, you and I, in our, in our natural state, in our sin, do we have a, a knowledge problem? Do we, have a, do we have an issue that we have to overcome, right? Can I, in my own knowledge, in my own, even on my best day, if I'm an unbeliever, can I know the things of God? No, why not? Because in order for me to know the things of God, I have to possess who? The Spirit of God. So if you look at the verse, it says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but who? See, now, once you have the Spirit of God in you, and you have God's Word, now can you know the things of God? But on your own, see, do, see, do you know your own mind? Does the Spirit of God know God's mind? So when you got saved, did God the Holy Spirit take you out of Adam and place you in Jesus Christ? When you were placed into Jesus Christ, did the Holy Spirit seal you in that position under the day of redemption? Are you in what places you in the body of Christ as God the Holy Spirit puts you there and seals you into Christ, right? And so now, in your, in your uh, regenerated state, if you will, now do you possess the Spirit of God? Now, because you possess the Spirit of God, now do you have the capacity, now that's a key word, do you have the capacity to know God's mind? Because he's already revealed it to you, number one. And number two, does his spirit that wrote the word live in you? So if you look at verse 11, he says, again, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. Now, I kind of got a little bit ahead of myself here, but we need to look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, now, we might possibly one day receive the Spirit that is of God when we confess all our sins. Is that what it says? You guys are either asleep or you're confused. Is that what it says? We might possibly one day receive the Spirit of God, in verse 12, once we have enough faith. Is that what it says? No, it says... Now we have received. So if you just stop there, is it clear you've received something? Yeah. He says, now we have received. Again, note the past tense on the verb what? Received. We have received. Once again, this is speaking about an action that was accomplished at a specific time in the past. If you are a believer, was there a point in time that you received God the Holy Spirit? Yep. Before that point... Did you have him? No. Before that point, were you contrary to him? Before that point, Ephesians 2, were you walking according to the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience? So you weren't walking according to the spirit of God. You were walking according to your own what? To your own spirit and that, that general spirit of the world that's out there that's in rebellion against who? Against God. Verse 12, now we have received. So it's very clear that something, that you have received something if you're a believer. All right? Well, notice what he says. For we have received not the spirit of what? The world. So what did you receive? Well, the one, first thing he tells you is this isn't what you what? Receive. You didn't receive this. 
You didn't receive the spirit of the world. Were you already in that anyway? Hold your hand there and come over to Ephesians 2. What we received from God, we, we didn't receive the spirit of the world. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of what? Disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh and of the mind, fulfilling the, the lust of our flesh, excuse me, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as what? See, is that, that's who you were in your natural state, right? In other words, when you were, you know, everyone thinks babies are so cute, and they are. And it's a good thing they are, because if they weren't, there wouldn't be too many babies around. <laughs> They'd be a pain in the neck, right? Okay? But when that baby comes out of its mother's womb, folks, doctrinally and positionally, does that child come into this world inherit as a possessor of a sin nature and dead in trespasses and sins in Adam? Yes. Why? Because death, for by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have what? Sin, right? What Adam, what Adam did brought a curse upon the entire human race, right? And you don't, you ever notice you don't have to spend any time teaching your kids how to be selfish? I guarantee you, I've spent no time teaching my kids how to be selfish. Because they come out knowing how to do that. Right? Because the problem they have is they're like me. They're kin to their daddy. And I'm kin to Adam. And if I'm in that state, there's a spirit, according to verse 2, that is working in the children of disobedience. And this is not the spirit that we receive. Go back, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When he says in verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world. You already had that, didn't you? We have received not the spirit of the world. But the Spirit, which is of who? Of God. See, when you got saved, what did you get? What did you receive? You received the Spirit of God. And when you received the Spirit of God, did you also thereby receive the ability in your inner man, that ability that the Spirit has to search all things and to know the deep things of God? So even as a believer, you, you, you don't... You, Think about it. How did you come to understand the mystery at all? You had a scripture that told you about it, right? You had, a, you had the same Holy Spirit that's in your inner man as you read it to cause you to what? To understand it, right? So you, you, you can't know anything about the secret, you can't know anything about the hidden wisdom of God, the wisdom of God in mystery, you can't know anything about the deep things of God apart from the fact that you have received the Spirit that is from who? Of God. Now notice, do I need to believe in the mystery to be saved? Does understanding that what God did to and through the Apostle Paul in revealing the information about the body of Christ, does that save me and justify me eternally before God? What saves me and justifies me eternally before God is understanding that I'm a sinner, right? And that Christ died for my sins, that he shed his blood for my sins, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. And when I put my faith in that and that alone, am I saved? When I'm saved, as part of the package deal, not only do I receive the forgiveness of sins, but I receive all this other cool stuff too, in that he takes me out of Adam, he puts me into Christ, and then he gives me a spirit. And now he's in me. And now when I come to the Word, now can I read the Word and understand the deep things of God that are revealed to, the, to me in the Word of God. Because we know that God's made known, Ephesians chapter 1, the mystery of his what? Of his will. Now, Let's go on with verse 12. He says in verse 12, now we, have, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. What's the next word? That. Circle it. That. The purpose and the intent. Why? 
Why did you receive the Spirit which is of God? That, second half of the verse, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of who? Okay, so I, let's go all the way back up to verse 8 now. What was the problem with the princes of this world? They didn't what? They didn't know something. And in not knowing something, what did they do? The crucified Christ, right? Now you and I, because we've received the Spirit which is of God, now do we have the capacity to what? To know. So we can know things that they didn't know. Remember how I said to you that I used to think about this, this passage in a compartmentalized way. That was wrong. All of this stuff is all building on what he said, right? And what he's doing is he's explaining to you how you and I can know the wisdom of God in a mystery. So that we don't have to be like those guys up there and operate in total, complete ignorance of it. We can know it's been revealed. We can know it's been made known. And the way we can know it is because we've received the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, but here's the point, right? I don't get too far ahead of myself. Why were we given the Spirit which is of God at a particular point in time in the past? The purpose and the intent is so that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. But I want to point something out to you there. That phrase, might know. Are you automatically going to know it? When you get the Spirit of God, when you receive the Spirit of God at a point in time in the past, did the Spirit come into you and automatically intelligize you to everything God was going to do? No. Did He give you the pack? Did He give you the capacity so that you might know it? You see the difference? Has God made His stuff? Is He made it knowable? Has he given you all the tools and all the resources and all the things that you're going to need to know it, to know the deep things of God if you want to know it? Yeah. But has he automatically opened up your brain and just dumped all that stuff in and said, here, go on? No. So he says in verse 12, he says, that we might know. And I know, you know, some of you don't like it when I say this, but that, that, that verb, might know, is subjunctive which means the knowing is subject to whether or not you are going to go out and what? Pursue it or not. But is it, is, has every avenue been made known and opened up for you to know it if you want to, as a believer? God, God, hasn't hold, God has not held anything what? Back from you. The only thing that is lacking, possibly for some of us, is the choice to go after it. Now he says in verse 12, <coughs> that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So again, all believers have been given the capacity to know these things, but the sad reality is, is that not all believers choose to utilize that which has been given to them. So if you look at the next, so he says that we might know, now watch, the things that are what? Notice that they're freely given to you, irrespective of your knowledge of it. You see that? He says that we might know, maybe you know, maybe you don't, the things that are freely what? So are the things freely given to you even if you don't know about them? Do you remember a few years ago when we did an entire series titled The Things Freely Given to Us of God? And we went through all of Paul's epistles and we studied those things that God freely gave us in Christ. Do you remember that? that? That series of studies, it's all online if you're interested in that information. But the point is, if you look at the verse, he says that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, folks, even in your justified state, even in your saved state, even having been given and afforded all of the things necessary for you to understand this, God is still not going to force you to know things that you don't want to know. You see what I'm saying? So he says that we might know the things that are freely given. There's no doubt about whether or not they've been freely what? There's some doubt about whether or not you're going to choose to what? To know it, to learn it, to do the work, to study, 
to show yourself what? Approved. But if you study to show yourself approved, do you have all the tools and the capacity through, the, through your regenerated state in Christ, through the Word of God, to know God's mind and to, and to know the deep things of God? God hasn't held any of that back. So we receive the Spirit of God. The, the Spirit, we receive the Spirit which is of God in verse 12 for the purpose and the intention of knowing the things freely given to us of God. In other words, we cannot know these things in any other what? way. Has man been searching from the beginning of the world with his eyes, his ears, and his heart to know what God has prepared for them that love him? Verse 9. The only way man knows any of that stuff is if God, the Holy Spirit, does what? Teach. First God, first God has to what? Reveal it. And once God has revealed it and made it known, he's, he's given you His Spirit so that the Spirit can what? Teach it to you. Now, it's like anything else. I teach high school <laughs> as a profession, and I can guarantee you, as sure as you're sitting in that seat, as bad as I want a kid to know something, he's got to want to learn it. He's got to want to learn it. And if he doesn't think it's important, or she doesn't think it's important, and they think they know better, and why do we need to know this? Because I said so. No. <clears throat> why do we need to know this? And they don't want it. It doesn't matter how much intervention the teacher wants to do. It doesn't matter what the parent... If the kid doesn't want it, he's not going to get it. Right? You want to know what? Same thing's true with you and I as believers. God has made known the mystery of His will. He's given you His Holy Spirit that resides in you and dwells you as a member of the body of Christ. And He's saying, you, if you allow me, I will, I will take that Word and I will take that Spirit that I gave you and I, will, and I will teach you the deep things of God. But you've got to what? You've got to want to learn. In the context, as we work our way to closing here, in the context, look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. In the context, the things freely given to us of God in verse 12 relates back to the deep things of God in verse 10, which relates to the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden wisdom in verse what? 7, which constitutes the wisdom that Paul was speaking among the perfect in verse 6. Let me say that again. The deep things of God in verse 12 relates back up to verse 10 when he talks, I'm sorry, the things freely given to you of God in verse 11 relate back up to what he's talked about in verse 10 about the deep things of God. The deep things of God is the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom. In verse 7, which constitutes the wisdom that Paul is speaking among the perfect in verse 6. It is absolutely wrong to come to verse 9 and think he's all of a sudden talking about something else. Because the whole way through, he's still talking, he's elaborating, and he's still discussing in the context what he brought up starting in verse 6. And that's what he wants you to know. None of this information, none of this information could have been known by mankind apart from God revealing it by a spirit in verse 10 and giving believers the spirit which is of God in verse 12 so that they could what? Know it. Okay? And last, in verse 10, we see, in verse 10, we see that the wisdom of God in a mystery was revealed by the Spirit of God to the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So we see that the wisdom of God in a mystery was revealed by the Spirit of God to the Apostle Paul. 
And in verse 12, we observe that the same Spirit enables all believers to know the truth he first revealed to who? To Paul. So all of this... See, you have the capacity to not make the same mistake that the principalities and powers in heavenly places made and not knowing the wisdom of God in the mystery. Because God has taken the wisdom of God in the mystery that was hidden. Notice, notice again the contrast. In verse 7, it's the hidden what? Wisdom. And then look at verse 10. But God hath what? So what was hidden is now what? Revealed. What was a secret is now what? Made manifest, made known. And you and I are offered the opportunity to not make the same mistake those, prince, those, those princes of this world made in not knowing about the wisdom of God and the mystery because God has revealed it. God has made it known. He's made it available. And not only has He made it known and made it available and, and had the ministry of the Apostle Paul to communicate that to you, He's given you His Spirit. And He's put His Spirit in you. And by, there, and by that capacity, you have the ability to know the things freely given of God. You have the ability to know the deep things of God. And you have the ability to know and understand the wisdom of God and the mystery. Which those guys couldn't and didn't what? No. It's amazing. When you, when you really stop to think about what you and I have as members of the church, the body of Christ and all of the, 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 the spiritual capacity that God has placed in you and I by giving you His Spirit and giving you His completed Word to work in conjunction with each other to teach you the mind of God. Okay? That's why when you go all, go all the way to verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Do any, would any of you in your natural ability, or any of you be all so audacious to say that you know the mind of the Lord, and say to the Lord, come over here, Lord, let me, let me tell you the way it is. Let me teach you something here. Let me, let me lecture you for a minute. Why, why did you... Why did you do it this way and that way? And why, you know, why didn't you make it more easy to understand? And why this right division thing? And why this dispensational thing? And why, Paul, you already had 12 apostles. Why did you need another one? How's that? So again, what do we see in that verse? We see another rhetorical question, don't we? But how's it end? How do you have the mind of Christ? You have the mind of Christ here and in here. Because what he, the, the same person, God the Holy Spirit, that he put in here wrote that. And when you read and study that, the Holy Spirit takes that and, and uploads it, transfers it off the page into your inner man. Where then he creates a reservoir tank. I know I'm of doctrine. So that when you go out into your life and you're like, oh, what do I do here? He's already educated you in how God would think about that thing. So then you can make decisions out there based upon his mind that you got here and stored up in here. I don't know how to say it any more plain than that. I've, I've, I've drawn, in past teaching, I've, I've drawn that target with the three rings, right? On the board. And I said, on the outer ring, you have the stuff that you don't know anything about. Then in the, in the next, in the middle ring, you have the stuff that you kind of know something about. And then in the center, you have the, you have the stuff that you know that you know, Right? Your job and my job as believers is to take stuff from those rings and move as much of that information into the center as you can. Because when you do that, you create, and you create a spiritual muscle in your inner man that is able to be exercised, that you can draw from in the details of your life because you've uploaded the doctrine into your soul. If you think that is going to be accomplished solely by listening to me for an hour on Sunday... 
No. And I'm not trying to be legalistic. I'm just telling you a fact. As believers, we need to be constantly undergoing spirit, the renewing of our mind. You know, my computer, it has, a, it has a virus program on it that every time I turn it on, it scans the computer for viruses, for, for spyware, for malware, for stuff that's trying to get at and attack that computer. The same thing happens to you every day in your inner man. You wake up, you turn on the news, you talk to people, and you know what? The adversary is trying to get to, he's, he's attacking your inner man. That's why you need to renew your mind. You need, to, you need to, every day when you get up, you need to reboot that mind with the Word of God. And it's not going to just happen here. For those of you that are parents, if you think that because you're sending your kid to church, and they're going through Sunday school and youth group and teen ministry, that that alleviates you of your responsibility to be teaching your own kids. You are sorely mistaken. Okay? Don't, don't abdicate your spiritual responsibility to your children, to me, or to any other members of the board of this assembly, and then get mad at us for when you don't like the outcome. See, there's a choice that we have to make, right? And God, get, God under grace, He's free. He lets you. If you don't want to do it, fine. He, he's not going to stand over there and whack you and smack you around and, you know, smite you. But just know that if that's the choice you make, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're depleting the tank. You're not giving the Holy Spirit anything to what? Anything to work with. You know, you go out, you go work out in your physical man, and you drain your electrolytes, and your, your, you know, you sweat and you stuff like that, and you, you drink, you know, you drink Gatorade or you drink something, and the whole point is to take to replenish that which you just what. You go out in the world every day, and there's people that are draining your tank, and if you don't ever put and replenish that tank with God's word, you're going to find you've run dry. Okay? But what God has done is He's given you every capacity, me, every capacity to live and to know His mind. Now, I know I got ahead of myself, but next week we'll look at the rest of this, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for these saints that have gathered here to hear your word preached. We pray that perhaps the practical tone of this message will be received and. Each individual believer is, is free before you to evaluate these things in their own mind and in their own life. But let's not squander the, the rich resources that God has placed within us to do His work, to make decisions with His mind, and to function with the mind of Christ. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.